Now let's look at what we have learned and apply it to the case of a simple campus. In this campus, we've got one subnet per building. And the slide shows an Ethernet switch uh, with a routing process turned on, so it has the layer 3 capability turned on. And the two ports on the left have been configured in different VLANs. The dark red port is VLAN 10, and the green port is in VLAN 20. Each VLAN has an IP address, and this IP address will be used as the default gateway for any devices that connect to this switch. If we've got multiple subnets per building, then we would make the gigabit ports on this switch, rather than just an access port, we'd make them a trunk port. So you see the example here, the, the red on the left, that's interface gigabit one. It's now been defined as a trunk, and it's allowing VLANs 10, 11, and 12 in through that trunk port. We've defined IP addresses for VLAN 10 to be 10.1.0.1, for VLAN 11 to be 10.1.1.1, and for VLAN 12 to be 10.1.2.1. So these are the default gateways that end users would use if they're on the respective VLANs. Gigabit 2 in this core switch that we have would be similarly set up to connect to another building. So this building would be using VLANs 20, 21, and 22. And we have the same IP addresses defined for VLAN 20, 21, and 22. So again, based on what you have learned so far in this video series, what has to be different at the building aggregation switch? So let's have a look at some of the hints and tips about all this. Remember, one subnet equals one VLAN. We've advised in several sessions before never to use VLAN 1. It's the default VLAN on many different vendor switches and often has special default behavior. In fact, in some cases, you can't even turn it off. So be very wary about VLAN 1. It should never be used. It may appear by default on all ports. It's very hard quite often to use it with tagging. So it's better to ignore it, and if you can, remove it. But VLANs 2 through to 4094 are usable and should be more than enough for a modern campus. What other hints and tips can we look at? Well, it's also important not to enable the same VLAN on links to different buildings. We want to try and keep the group of VLANs within a building. VLANs within the building, routing at the core, has been a general theme throughout this series. A layer 3 switch lets you do this, and you'll find many design documents talking about how to configure this, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea. You end up with VLAN spaghetti. You end up with a big mess that you cannot scale and you cannot manage. So this implies you're going to have a wired VLAN per building and a Wi-Fi VLAN per building and whatever other VLANs you need. The VLANs will stay in the building. We carry them on a trunk to the core router and the router there will route between them. And it's actually very rare for a user on a wired VLAN in a building to need to be able to send vast amount of data to a user on another VLAN in the same building. Most campus end users are consumers consuming internet content or accessing content that's in the network core. And when you're doing your VLAN planning, make sure you choose a consistent scheme. So for example, VLANs 2 to 9 could be for the NOC, 10 to 19 for building 1, 20 to 29 for building 2, and so forth. You're unlikely to need more than 10 VLANs per building. And so if you follow this scheme, this is going to allow you for up to 400 buildings with ease. Is your campus really that big? So this could be a very viable scheme for you to follow. And it means you can identify traffic and users based simply on the VLANs that they are assigned to. Some layer 3 switches will let you configure routed ports, making it work exactly like a router instead of a switch. Some also have routed sub-interfaces with VLAN tags. This means you could route multiple subnets to each building without actually having to create separate VLANs. This will help you scale in the case that you're going to run out of VLANs. 
The other thing to remember is you can actually use the same VLAN tags for different subnets in different buildings. And this makes the distribution and edge switch configurations almost identical everywhere. So rather than the example we talked about in the previous slide where we said build, building one would have VLAN 10 to 19 and building two would have 20 to 29, make every building use VLAN 10 to 19. Because you're not going to be passing the VLANs from building to building. They're all routed in the core, and as long as the core router knows how to get between the different VLANs configured, that's all you need to know. So looking on a switch where you've got fully routed interface, again, the configuration example shows you how this might work. So the gigabit one interface on the left, the red one, shows that it's not a switch port. So this is now a routed port. And we now create sub-interfaces. So interface gig 1.10, we have said encapsulation dot 1q10. That means we're tagging that interface, sub-interface, as in VLAN 10. So all the traffic on that one will be VLAN 10. And gigabit 1.11, encapsulation dot 1q11, that is VLAN 11. So again, traffic on this interface going out to the distribution will be tagged according to which VLAN it is sitting in. We can do the same with gigabit 2 and so on and so forth. Both buildings in this case are using VLAN tags 10 and 11, but these are different and isolated subnets. Remember, we are not passing VLAN 11 in one building to VLAN 11 in another building, because this is a fully routed interface.